As of today, all of the Proud Boy leaders charged in the wake of the insurrection have been found guilty by a jury of their peers and sentenced. The five men will spend the next decade or two in prison, from Enrique, Enrique Tarrio's record 22 years to Dominic Pizzola's 10 years. Now we're learning that the men were offered plea deals by the Justice Department that would have drastically reduced their prison time. According to a filing by an attorney for the two, two of the men, the offer would have cut their collective time by more than half. They all declined and went to trial and will spend a combined 82 years in prison, adding to the cumulative 700 years in January 6 sentences so far. So now, the leadership of the Proud Boys behind bars for 10 to 20 years, I guess it's worth asking what comes next for a group, what it means for our imperiled democratic order. Andy Campbell is a senior editor and reporter at HuffPost, the author of We Are the Proud Boys, how a right-wing stre right -wing street gang ushered in a new era of American extremism, and he joins me now. You know, Andy, I've, I've sort of, I've read your reporting on the Proud Boys, covered them enough over the years, and they've always sort of straddled this line between, like, kind of preposterous cosplay and actual kind of menace. And, and the sort of culmination, I think, of their actions was January 6th, where they ended up in that latter category. How, how do you understand the group and how do you understand what they did on January 6th in relation to that, that history? Right. Well, they project themselves uh, to the public as a drinking club who sort of uh, you know, accidentally fell into self-defense on January 6th. And during a bunch of events on the parade of violence, they've been going on seven, eight years now. Uh, but the Proud Boys while they are very drunk, while they are doing drugs out there, while they are partying, their directive and, and the thing that they work toward is committing acts of political violence for Republican causes. And for the, their inception, Trump was their director. Trump was the one pointing out the grievances that they would fight for. And at the end, it was Trump. Um, you know, they we were just told that they uh, were about to take plea deals or that they didn't take plea deals. It turns out Enrique Tarrio gave an interview today uh, with the Gateway Pundit in which he said outrageously that he didn't take a plea deal because the federal government wanted him to lie about Trump. And it just shows, you know, how much they believe Trump is their guy, despite getting zero love from the guy uh, throughout their entire existence. So you've got the, you, you know, these guys are all going to do serious time. The Tario got 22 years, the, the head of that organization. I didn't realize he's giving an interview to Gateway Pundit, which shows that, like, none of them seem to actually be remorseful or actually filled with regret. It seems like they're committed to this. Um, we should also say there's a long context if you read, you know, 20th century European history of, like, right-wing parties having, like, street-fighting thugs that beat people up and commit political violence on behalf of far-right parties. Um, what does this mean for them now? Well, let's get it straight. The Proud Boys didn't go out away after January 6th. They're not going away now. I mean, despite their leaders sitting behind bars, the Proud Boys have been fighting the GOP's grievances in the street. That grievance lately has been LGBTQ issues, uh, trans health care and drag queen story hours among them. So they've been out across the country uh, going more local and, and attacking and harassing people at drag queen story hours children's hospitals, public libraries, places where these things are discussed. Um, the only change that happened since these sentences and since January 6th is that they aren't amassing for Donald Trump because it's worrisome. They're worried mm. about federal inf infiltration. They're worried about consequences. Um, but they were directed by Enrique Tario to go local, to run for office, to sidle up next to politicians in their locales and, and, and do things that way. And they've done that very successfully under the public eye since January 6th. Um, uh, so, so their extremism continues. And I argue that if the Proud Boys dissolve tomorrow or change their name, which I don't expect to happen, uh, the, the political violence that they helped normalize for this era of the GOP uh, is still so ingrained that that is sticking around. The, the, the extremism is still out there. It's still being put into policy. Yeah, so I think we're that, not seeing the Proud Boys going away anytime soon. Yeah, I think that point about, um, you know, again, in, in 20th century European politics, particularly in other places in the world, it has been a not uncommon thing for uh, parties, movements, and factions, particularly on the, the extreme right, to have a street fighting force, a violent force, sometimes that are outright armed and murderous. Um, they have introduced a kind of form of those politics, which hadn't really been quite there in American politics in a while. Obviously, this is what, you know, 
various groups like the KKK were back in the 1920s. They were an armed part, a violent part of a political faction. Um, you also, you, about this, about the sort of local leaders, you're writing that the Proud Boys, they've made inroads with GOPs since January 6th. Members have been running for minor elected offices across the country. Several have secured seats alongside the GOP elite. A Proud Boy in Sarasota County, Florida, for example, was elected last year to the County Republican Executive Committee, where he has the power to influence local politics alongside fellow committee member Mike Flynn, Trump's one-time national security advisor. We've got news today that both Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy have said that they're Sentences are too long and asked about considering pardons and definitely not ruling it out. What do you think that does? How, what's the effect of that kind of language from non-Trump Republican leaders? Well, look, I mean, it shows that the Proud Boys and in the violence that they've committed is still fully embraced by the GOP. Yeah. Uh, this political violence isn't going away until the GOP calls its neo-fascist foot soldiers out of the street, right? And until they, they believe in elections. Um, the next election uh, is going to be under threat until the Republicans pull that out. And so to have DeSantis saying that, the Proud Boys certainly believe them and will throw their support behind them for it. Andy Campbell, who uh, wrote a really good book about this. Thank you very much.